So, um, as we begin this session tonight, as we think about this idea of Trinity, um, what are the things that what are the things that come to your minds? What what do all? I'll give you a chance right now, actually, to unmute. What 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 do, what do you guys? What comes to mind when you think about the Trinity? What are some simple things that just come to mind? What, you know, phrases or words or ideas. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, the unique nature of God. Three and one, good. Okay, think of the members of the Trinity. What else? Some mist. I would think some mystery there, right? Would you guys agree with that? The idea of some mystery, something, something, something far bigger than us. That's. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't always kind of line up with the way that we experience the world. It's a, kind of a concept that we understand is bigger than us and our experience. Good. Well, let's let's do this. Let's start with the term Trinity itself. And um, Kevin, I've, I, I'm going through a slide thing here that I'll, I'll just send you the, I'll send everybody in the class the slideshow, the, the, the Google slide packet. Um, so you can actually look through these and have them if you want to hold on to the, the, the slides, okay, since you're on the phone and not, see, not, see, not seeing them. But we're going to start with the term Trinity. Uh, let's begin there. One of the most important things I think that it's just for us to understand, because we want to have a right understanding of this doctrine, is this first point. The term is not found in Scripture. The term is not found in Scripture. Now, some might think that that's a um, some might think that that's kind of a um, I don't know that I'm already kind of setting myself up for trouble by saying that it's not found in Scripture. But obviously, I'm just stating a fact. It's not found in Scripture. I think I think it's extremely helpful for us to to understand that because that will help us have the right mindset and uh, motivation to be able to build kind of build this uh, build our understanding of the doctrine so let's start there with the term is not found in scripture uh, where does the term come from well the first per, the first time that word trinity appears is in a letter of one of the church fathers a lesser known church father named theophilus of Antioch. If you remember, Antioch was that place north of Jerusalem in what today we would imagine would, would be, um, I believe, Lebanon or Syria. Um, but Antioch is where, where some of the first Gentile converts of the church in the book of Acts were to be found. And if you recall, it was uh, the newly converted Saul who became Paul who ended up in uh, Antioch with Barnabas, and they were teaching the disciples there. Well, fast forward, you know, 100 and, 110, 120 years, and Theophilus is the uh, leader of the church there, and he mentions the word Trinity, but but he doesn't really go into detail. He just mentions the idea of the of God, the Word, and wisdom, um, which, based on Proverbs chapter eight was a way to talk about the Holy Spirit. But the interesting thing about when that term first appears in about 175 AD is that it's just kind of said nonchalantly. It's, it's, it's said in a way that assumes that the people he's writing to know what he's talking about. So I, I think that's, that's pretty important. The, the first place we really see a defense of the Trinity, this concept, is with Tertullian, a, a better known church father. He wrote his, that, that defense in a work called Against Praxeus in about 210 A.D., 210 A.D. So we're talking about, what, 100, 140, 150 years uh, after, um, well, longer than that, o almost, yeah, 180 years after Jesus um, returned to the Father, 170, 180 years. So he writes a defense of this idea of the Trinity, 
and um, goes into detail. Um, I was just looking at that passage today, and it's really interesting because a lot of it we would I would go yeah that's really good others place I'd go uh it's not quite it's not quite as tight as it needs to be the thinking <laughs> so it certainly was an idea that was present and was kind of being formulated and thought through and had been for many years but Tertullian's the first one that we have an actual preserved literary um example of someone spelling out what was uh, considered orthodox belief. And I mentioned that because here's a final bullet point on this slide. I mentioned orthodox beliefs because a lot of what we know about Trinitarian thinking from the early church was formulated by those who were trying to confront teachers who were anti-Trinitarian. So you can see I've got a number of dates listed here, 220 AD, 269 AD, 325 AD, and 381 AD. So 220 was, um, was a rejection and excommunication of a guy named Paul of Samosasta, who believed in the idea, what, what, what would be called adoptionism. And the adoptionist view of Christ was that at his baptism, Jesus was adopted as the Son of God. He hadn't been the Son of God before that. In 269, let me see if I can recall. I don't have my note. I don't have any further notes here. 269 was a rejection of the Sabellian movements. Um, it was the uh, Council of Ephesus. And Sabellianism was a early church heresy that believed in a modalist view of God. And modalism is basically the belief that there is one God who expresses himself in three different modes in different contexts. He can be the Father, he can be the Son, he can be the Holy Spirit. So if he's the if he's the father in the Old Testament, then he's the son in the New Testament while Christ is on earth. And then he's the Holy Spirit uh, after with the church. Um, obviously, a very problematic way of thinking. Uh, but there are they're actually still modalists today. Um, if you've ever heard of oneness Pentecostals today, that's exactly what they are, modalists. Uh, so that's a heretical teaching condemned by the early church, rightly so, based on scripture. 325 is the one that you've probably heard of, which is the Council of Nicaea, the first Council of Nicaea. So in Nicaea, that was a response to another false movement called the Arian movement, Arian controversy. Uh, and the Arian, uh, not A-R-Y-A-N, but A-R-I-A-N, was, was named as such because Arius of Alexandria a bishop in Alexandria was teaching that Jesus was something less than God, that he was some other kind of being, like an angel or something else, uh, that he was not fully God. So he contested the deity of Christ, and he was roundly rejected and condemned by the Council of Nicaea. And then in 381 AD, uh, the Const Council of Constantinople uh, basically came and did some cleaning up of the Nicene Creed, uh, that statement by adding more about the Holy Spirit, which they had neglected to do the first time. They were really focused in 325 on the Father and the Son and really hammering out the relationship between the Father and the Son. Uh, does anybody know who modern Ar Arians are? What's a modern group that's actually Aryan in their the in their uh, in their teaching? Uh, Islam, yeah, but Islam doesn't even hold Jesus. They just think he's a human prophet. They don't think of him as this is a group that uh, uh, so so called Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, absolutely, yeah, they're the best example of a modern day Aryan group. Uh, again, <laughs> not Aryan. It's like white power, <laughs> Arius, followers of Arius of Alexandria. 
So uh, again, the point is that a lot of what we understand about uh, Trinitarian thinking as it developed in, and, and I want to be clear about developed, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it wasn't being constructed, it was being understood and worked out from what scripture revealed. Um, so a lot of what we understand was against those who came with false teaching and the church routinely had to deal with this, which gives us encouragement that there was an understanding of the Trinity. Uh, and there had been an understanding of the Trinity, even if it wasn't completely spelled out. Um, it took time for for the best minds and leaders to really kind of work on making sure there was clear explanation of that. Uh, it was something that regularly the majority of the church came against those who tried to teach otherwise. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, good. So. Um, in, in continuing to talk about this, I have the Trinity. We talked about this first bullet point, which was the term is not found in Scripture. But moving on, I want to make this point: though the term does not term does not appear in the Holy Bible, the goal of this study is to show the concept is wholly biblical. W H O L L Y. <laughs> the concept is wholly biblical and why this teaching, this doctrine matters. So though the term does not appear in the Holy Bible, I can't emphasize enough that the goal of the study is to show the concept is wholly biblical and why this teaching, this doctrine matters. It's not just a dusty old doctrine that you need to make sure that you have correct, but it really just sits up on a pedestal you know, you, that you dust off every once in a while. No, it really does matter to how we live uh, our Christian lives when we understand this concept. So what we're going to do, uh, well, here's what I want to do. Instead of me just telling you, okay, here's what we believe about the Trinity, we're going to actually approach it from what we would call a biblical theo theology or a biblical theological orientation. That is, we want to build a case for the Trinity from Scripture. One of the things that I've done in the past, in, in my, you know, many many encounters and conversations over the years with the Jehovah's Witnesses, is sometimes they will say, "Well, we don't believe in the Trinity," and they'll say, "You believe in the Trinity," and I'll say, "I do." I said, "But let's let's say for the sake of the argument, let's just chuck the idea of the Trinity. Let's throw it out the window." And they're like, "Okay, that sounds good to us." <laughs> so I said, "Let's chuck it." And let's go back and kind of build from scratch what we know the Bible says and come up with a way to make sense of what the Bible says that that really is balanced, that doesn't 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 neglect, um, you know, ideas or put undue emphasis on certain ideas, but really tries to explain all of what the Bible says. And in doing so, I'm trying to remove that that maybe. Uh, what do you call it, that stumbling block for them of the word Trinity and try to walk them through how the idea, you know, what the idea means. And that's exactly what we're going to do uh, in this class is just walk through it. A really simple way to begin, as you see from the second bullet point, a simple way to begin is by, is by simply looking at generically Trinitarian verses. Generically Trinitarian verses. Um, so I say generically because these are not these are not verses that spell out the concept of the Trinity for us, but they're in, they're in general, in a generic way, in a general way, they're Trinitarian. So I'd like for, for, for someone, as we, after I read through these, each, each example, I'd like someone to explain why it's Trinitarian. So for example, here's the first one. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Why is that Trinitarian in general? <laughs> uh, point him out for us, mom. And Jesus is just, 
Jesus is described here as also as the son. The son. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Even though God is not mentioned explicitly in terms of the father, we know that's the implication, isn't it? <laughs> when he says, this is my beloved son. There's, there's no, yeah, there's no argument or no, it's clear. So there they are. There's a generically Trinitarian verse. All three members of the Trinity are right there present. So even if somebody didn't believe uh, a a creedal, creedal definition of the Trinity, you you could bring someone to say, look at the look at the connection and start with this idea of here's Jesus, here's the Holy Spirit, here's the Father, Jesus the Son, and um, uh, and do we see this? Do we see these three in interaction together in other parts of Scripture? And of course, the answer is yes. Here's another example from the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Someone else jump in there and tell me why this is Trinitarian. Yeah, yeah. So, but you, you just said the names in, that we do it in. Is that is there a plural or a singular here for that word? Right. But but the word name is singular. Do you see that? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not plural name. It's not plural names. It's just singular, the name. I don't know the word, but I do know it's in the singular. Yeah. I, I'd have to look it up. So yeah, it, it, the name is the, of the Father and the Son. They, they all share the same name, which of course, if you've studied the Bible long enough, you know name is just not a spoken label. It, name often represents the essence or character of the person that is being spoken about. So like like we pray in the name of Jesus, we're not, not just because we say the name, but we pray it because we're, we're, we're in Christ by God's grace. And so it's by his uh, grace, his authority, the privilege that we have through Christ. So, yeah, Stephen, you're exactly right with this idea that this this is this is taking it up another level from from Matthew three, because even though all of those three were interacting in that Matthew three uh, passage about the baptism of Jesus. Here we have the name strung together and then connected to a singular name. What else, does anything else stand out to you guys here about uh, tri tri the Trinity? Like like an I am uh, from uh, like the Gospel of John and, uh, and right, God re revealing himself in Exodus 3 as I am that I am, I am who I am. No, but I think you're onto something in that last verse though in terms of focusing there because how, how would Jesus say, I am with you always to the end of the age when he was about to rise up and ascend into heaven? How could, how could, he, how could he be with him? Yeah, absolutely. Because the spirit is later identified as not only the spirit of God, but the spirit of Jesus in other passages. Yeah, that's right. The father and I will come and make our home with him in John 14. 14. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some really good stuff that we have here that gets, it should get somebody thinking about, again, this idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's another passage. Uh, we just heard this, uh, last month, Luke 135, and the angel answered, Gabriel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. Someone else, what do you what do you hear there? Trinitarian? Yeah, do we see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all there, all there, right? Well, let's let's keep going there. That's a good one. And here's another one from the Gospel of John. We talked mentioned this before about the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel. Um, actually, we didn't, but we will. Um, this is John fourteen twenty six. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
Do we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Absolutely, we do. So again, these are these are passages that we see the three uh, at work in different ways together. We're kind of building an understanding of this. Uh, what about in the epistles? What about the letters of the New Testament? Do we see similar examples of these three three grouped together? And the answer, of course, is yes. I'll give you one example. And, and again, these are just there are many many examples of passages like this. Uh, I could do four or five more, you know, uh, like this. Um, and there's others that are maybe a little harder to kind of see, but they're all there. Listen to Ephesians chapter three, verses fourteen through seventeen. Ephesians three fourteen through seventeen. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. This is Paul praying that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Any thoughts there about that passage? Trinitarian? But let, let's spell it out. Where do, we see the, where do we see the members of the Trinity? There you go. He's praying to God the Father. Yeah. Yeah. So re really, re really a neat, a neat kind of uh, w grouping, you know, or a way that the, inter the interwovenness of the Father and the Spirit and the Son, the way that God uses his Spirit to dwell, to, to empower us, the Spirit in, in our inner being at work, so that Christ dwells in us through faith. The spirit and that and and we'll talk about that in the coming weeks is 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 how is our Christian life Trinitarian in terms of how do we live that? How does it kind of intersect the concept and the teaching intersect with how we live our Christian lives? And this is a great passage that we'll come back to. But I hope these are helpful examples of these kind of generically Trinitarian verses. You find them really all over the New Testament. Uh, and it's a great place to start with somebody that you're talking to the Trinity about to say, here's, let me give you another one. Let me show you another passage. And it's really easy to establish a pattern of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, in, from passages like that. Okay, if, that, if that's okay, if that makes sense to you guys, I'm going to keep going forward here. So what we're going to do tonight in, in, in the time that we have remaining is we're, we're really just going to lay the groundwork for understanding the Trinity. Uh, and we're going to do that by understanding what Paul confessed in 1 Timothy 2.5. Um, this is what he said in 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God. Now that sounds like a very good Jewish thing to say, isn't there? <laughs> isn't that? There is one God. Um, Paul confessed that and we want to unpack, we want to ask that question as a Jew, as a Hebrew, what scriptural beliefs stood behind that statement for Paul? When he said, for there is one God, how does the Old Testament inform his, how did it inform his thinking and shape his thinking? And, how do, and then how do we hear that in Paul, uh, maybe some other places in the New Testament, which are these predominantly Jewish writers writing in the New Testament um, in light of the, the revelation there that Christ fulfilled. So this is where we begin with this idea that for there is one God. Um, so let's, let's go through the scriptures, mainly the Old Testament, and try to make sure that we really have this down and understand the implications of this belief, uh, this monotheistic belief. So for there is one God, the most one of the most famous statements that, that came to my mind immediately because it's one of the most famous statements in Judaism um, is the statement called the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 4. And that statement is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You guys all know that statement? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you do. Um, when it, when you see that capital Lord, what does that mean again? What does it represent? Yeah. 
Yahweh, yeah, the, pers the personal name for God. And that personal name for God is related to the, to the I am who I am, is most likely related to that revelation to Moses, the self-existent one. So Yahweh is, is most likely, uh, you know, that connected to that name, uh, the personal name of God revealed there. Um, what does this mean exactly, though? Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Anybody have any thoughts about what that might mean? Is this anti-Trinitarian? says that he's one, not three. Okay, good. That's a good, that's a good uh, suggestion. Anybody else? Uh, no, yeah, th no. The only, yeah, the, the, the Jews were, the Hebrews were the only monotheists <laughs> probably in the world in some sense. Although other traces of monotheism pop up here and here and there. Uh, like, for example, in Egypt, there was a brief time where they were monotheistic, uh, functionally monotheistic, because they worshipped just the sun god, uh, the disk of the sun, Aten. Uh, but they then they then they brought in all the other pantheon of Egyptian gods after that. It was a very brief period. So the Israelites were very very distinct in this in their practice. Well, let me, let me give you a translation of this that's probably a better translation of this phrase. Because I think what this phrase is actually saying, this, this Shema, is, um, is this. Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. Kind of what I think you were, that's what you were saying, Mom, in, in saying that. Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone is a way to translate that Hebrew. And all this is doing is really just building on what was revealed in the previous chapter of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 7, the second recitation of the Ten Commandments, the very first being, you shall have no other gods before me. So one of the questions that we could ask is, is this just, is this just functional? Can somebody mute their mic? It sounds like there's some some stuff going on in there. Um, so is this just functional slash practical monotheism? Is this just functional or practical monotheism? That is, is it is is Moses just saying, look, the only God that we have anything to do with is Yahweh. Just forget about the other gods. We're not serving them. Or is this a, or is there some kind of statement that the Old Testament is making that there are no other gods, there is only God? Well, these passages don't really tell us one way or the other. Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. That could be taken both ways. But even at the end of this book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 32, verse 39, we read this. See now that I, even I, am he. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Now, is that a statement about conceptual or, 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 is, or like uh, theological monotheism, theoretic, like a just true monotheism, that there is, there is only one God? Right, because there were there were the in the belief systems of the people around them, of that whole region, they did have what we'd call a pantheon of gods. Right, they had, they might have a they might have a chief deity like a Zeus or an Odin, but but those gods had other gods beside them, didn't they? Yah Yahweh says, "There's no god beside me." How does that final statement really drive that home? Right. So, so there's no other, if somebody had an idea about another kind of God or gods, that they are certainly not a God that could ever <laughs> overpower God in any way. Um, he is, he is God. So even, even still, we're, we're getting, we're, we're getting more clarity, I think, of this idea, although 
Um, I don't think just this passage could 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 I seal the deal about like no other gods in existence. But as we continue on in the Old Testament, uh, there are some there are some great places that really drive this this idea home of of true monotheistic uh, be, the belief that there is only one God because God makes that clear. For example, there's many verses in a couple chapters in Isaiah. Uh, chapter 43, chapter 44, chapter 45. Chapter 43 of Isaiah, verse 10 says, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> There's no, no other God uh, formed before, no other God formed after. There, there are no other gods. Uh, Isaiah 44, verse 6, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. So the eternality of God from everlasting to everlasting. God is the only one for whom that's true. There is no other God. Isaiah 44 verse 8, two verses later, he says, Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. And then there, you can. I've given you some other verses there. 45, chapter 45 of Isaiah, verses 5 and 6, verse 18, verses 21 and 22, and then on into chapter 46, verse 9. It's very clear when you start reading these, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theme in all of these chapters where he keeps making it very clear to them that uh, there is no other God. And Paul... Uh, where we started, the phrase that we see at the top of the slide, for there is one God, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Paul himself really unpacks this point for the Corinthians, who, of course, most of the Corinthian church, at least a, lar a large number of those in the Corinthian church, had come out of a polytheistic world, right, as Greeks. So Paul says very clearly to them, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. What does he mean there are many gods and many lords? Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think when we read in verse six, yet for us there is one God, I don't I don't think he's saying, well, you know, in our case, we only recognize one God uh, as if uh you know in a very pluralistic way or a relative way to say, well, you can believe what you want to believe. What's true? My thing is true and your thing is true at the same time. No, I think he's saying for us, we recognize there is only one God because the rest of his statement really makes that abundantly clear that though there are many so-called gods, many, many things called God, many so-called lords, uh, we know, in fact, that there's no real existence to any of these things. They're just the creation of man's imagination. So that's the, that really is the clear testimony of the Old Testament, the, the, the scriptures, that there is only one God. Therefore, when we get into, you know, and we see other places where it's kind of spelled out in different ways, or the statement is made and affirmed, like 2 Samuel 7, where David, in that very famous prayer uh, from which the Davidic covenant, we understand that the covenant made with David comes from, in that prayer, he says, therefore, you are great, O Yahweh, God, for there is none like you and there is no God besides you. So there's that emphasis on God is is completely unique. There's no one like him, nothing like him at all. No God besides you. Uh, we hear that again in Jeremiah 10 verses six and seven. There is none like you, O Yahweh. You are great. Your name is great in might. There is none like you, he says at the end of verse 7. So we hear that's a, re, re, a phrase that we hear repeated in the Psalms and other places. No one is like our God. There is not, nothing like our God. No one. 
So that's an emphasis again on the uh, on the, the the oneness, the idea that God is one. He alone is God. Uh, Jeremiah, and a few verses later in chapter ten, chapter ten, verse ten says, "But Yahweh is the true God, the true God." So, so that true qualifier, that true ad, that adjective, true is another way that the Old Testament really stresses that there is only one God, especially in the midst of such a polytheistic context, you know, culture, world, a world, so, uh, so much, uh, so many idols, so many false belief systems that were polytheistic. You know, Yahweh is the only true God. Uh, another one we could add to this is when it talks about in the Old Testament that God, that Yahweh is the living God, the living God. There's a contrast again, like true as is to, is to false, living is to uh, is to dead idols. The idols are dead; they are lifeless. God Yahweh is a living God. He truly does exist. Now, let me add something else into the mix here. Uh, notice that one of the ways that the Old Te Testament emphasizes the uniqueness of God is to emphasize the fact that he is the creator. We see that here in Isaiah 37, verse 16. If you uh, are familiar with Hezekiah and his prayer of going up to the temple when, uh, when the Assyrians were attacking or uh, threatening Jerusalem, it says he went up and he, and he laid out the, the letter from the Assyrians uh, on the floor in the temple and he prayed to God. Um, this is from that prayer. He says, O Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of the heavenly armies, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. So again, emphasis on God, uh, his rule and reign over his reign over all kingdoms of the earth. And he's the one who made all things. We see this again. We hear this again uh, in Isaiah 44, those chapters that we looked at. Hold on one second. Uh, the, yeah, the chapters that we looked at in Isaiah chapter 4. Those um, that emphasize so much that there are no other gods, we, uh, we see this statement. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Let's do that. Okay. I'm just making sure my battery doesn't turn off, you guys. Hold on a minute. I had a full charge, but that should be fine. Um, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. So there's another stress on the fact that, <laughs> emphasis on the fact there's no one beside God uh, in, in, in doing what he was doing as the maker of heaven and earth. Let's keep going here. Jeremiah 10, we, we saw from this passage before, but here's some more verses from Jeremiah 10 that really bring all these ideas together beautifully. Uh, this is verses 10 through 12 of Jeremiah 10. But Yahweh is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Thus shall you say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is he who made the earth by his power. He who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. So very clear there, emphasis on the creator God, that there is only one God who created all things. Let's talk about, what, uh, or let's talk about one more aspect of this fact that God alone is God, that there is only one God, the creator of heaven and earth. Uh, in Nehemiah chapter nine, we hear a beautiful uh, praise to God from the peoples as, as they were being encouraged to look back to God. Um, this, is their, this is part of that prayer and that praise. Uh, they say, blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. 
You are Yahweh, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. What's, what's different about this passage compared to maybe what Isaiah and Jeremiah said back here about God making all things, the creator of, of heaven and earth? What, what really comes across here as an emphasis? Okay, good. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to get away from the praise the praise orientation of this passage, these verses, it's really full of praise. It's a passage about worship, isn't it? And, and um, it's the fact that God alone is God and that he alone created all things that is, um, is, uh, is the focal point of the worship. I love how he says, blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So anything that's blessed in this world, anything that's praised in this world, far above that blessing and that praise is the blessing and praise that God deserves. I love that emphasis. And you really see that emphasis, you see that emphasis come out like in Roman, uh, uh, well, Romans 11, Paul, uh, who made the statement for there is one God in 1 Timothy 2, he says this simple, simply in Romans 11:36 puts it in kind of a nutshell expression for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. So that really just sim in concisely <laughs> uh, expresses everything that we've talked about. And maybe the clearest expression of this idea is one that um, Stephen, I know that you've really uh, been blessed by is that passage from Revelation 4 verse 11 that says yeah yep there it is why don't you read it Stephen yeah it's so powerful I love that one um, but that really that really lines up beautifully with so many passages in the Old Testament like we saw that um, that speak of, of God as the, as the one who made heaven and earth and that distinguishes him as the as the God, the only God. Um, let me keep going here. Uh, blessed be the, there's some here's some additional psalms and praises. This idea of worship of God, that the true God, the only God, receives worship. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Psalm seventy two verse eighteen. Let them pray. This is Psalm 148, verse 13. Let them praise the name of Yahweh, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. So those alone verses, and there's many of those, of course, that uh, really emphasize the uniqueness of God. Uh, the idea that God is, there is one God. Uh, and 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 no one there's no other gods he alone deserves our praise he's the maker of heaven and earth so really we get these 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 principles what have we seen we've seen a few principles let's weave them together god's people serve only one god first bullet point god's people serve only one god second bullet point since there's only one true god to serve Third bullet point, no one or nothing else is like him. Fourth point, since he alone made all things. Final point, therefore he alone is worthy of our worship and service. Does that make sense based on all the verses that we've looked at tonight? Yeah. God's people serve only one God since there's only one true God to serve. No one or nothing else is like him since he alone made all things. Therefore, he alone is worthy of our worship and service. 
So that's a that's a pretty quick little case for for you know monotheism from the Old Testament and the idea that that God alone is God. But we've got to start there. You know, we've got to start there in terms of understanding um, the Trinity. So uh, I put a couple points in here about what about you know what about such and such uh, from the Old Testament things that people might raise issues that people might raise. One of those issues is a passage like Psalm 82, Psalm 82, verse 6. You may be, you know, you may be familiar with, um, you may be familiar with this passage uh, from John, the Gospel of John, when Jesus quotes this. Uh, but Psalm 82, verse 6. Sorry, I'm just opening to it. Says, I said, God, this is God speaking. I said, you are God's son of the most high, all of you. So is that, that might be confusing to some. Is he saying that there are, is he saying that there are other gods? God is calling, is talking to other gods. If you want to open your Bible or, you know, browse over to that passage what do you think about that what does he mean when he says i said you are gods sons of the most high all of you who's he talking to what's that he's calling believers gods okay but still we're struggling and that this idea of gods <laughs> what 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 exactly is, is this a mormon a good mormon verse or what we're gods what does he say in the next verse? Who has the passage open? There you go. Okay. It's not in reference to spiritual beings because he wouldn't say you, you shall die like men. Okay. Yeah, look. Yeah, look at verse one. That's good. Look, it says God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. Now, that could be a very misleading verse, right? If, if you read that, it sounds like God's in the midst of a pantheon of gods. Well, the word the word that's used there is the word Elohim. Elohim and Elohim is a plural word that can be translated either gods or God. It's translated when it's translated for the God of Israel as Elohim, it just is translated God. Why, why might why might the name of why might the, the, the word that's used for the God of Israel be a plural? Any ideas? Yeah. Everything that we've looked at so far tells us that, that there's a singular God of Israel, right? He's one. Why would his name, why would one of the most common terms used to describe him, this, this word Elohim, be a plural, plural noun? Yes. That's exactly right. We know, we know from verse 1 that even though they are called Elohim, today we would probably put like single quotes around that. You know, I, I'm in the midst of the gods as, you hold, as they hold judgment. Look at the next verse. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Clearly, he's talking to human leaders who have the ability to judge justly or unjustly. And he calls them Elohim, gods, in order to kind of distinguish the fact that they are like gods among men in terms of their position, rulers, functionally. You know, they have this ability and that the God is in the midst of this, of these human rulers, and he's telling them to do what 
what the God, the only God would, would do, which is to practice righteousness and to, and to demonstrate justice. But if they don't, they're going to be walking in darkness. They have neither knowledge or understanding. They walk about in darkness. And he said, I, I said, you are God's sons of the most high, all of you, nevertheless, you're going to die like men, even though you have this inflated view of yourselves, you're going to fall like any prince would. And then arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So there's that final, that final submission to God as in confession of God. He is the only true God and he will bring judgment on the, on the exalted ones of the earth who are supposed to rule with justice. Who else is described as a God in the, in the New Testament? A God. Who is described as a God in the New Testament? Satan. Absolutely. He's called the God of this world uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, it, does that mean he's a God? What, why, why would they call him the God of this world? Yeah. Yeah, he, he functions as a ruler over the world and has, has the, has, in some sense, has the world under his sway, right? He's actually, and he's actually, he's actually the one that, that people are, he's, he's the one in, in certain ways, important ways is pulling the strings. That's right. He tempted him with that offer. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's important to be able to distinguish in passages where, where a word like this is being used, how it's being used. There's also another, what about a passage like Genesis 1, at the very beginning where God says, let us make, let us make man in our image. What do we do with that? Is, is he talking to a divine pantheon of gods? Is he talk, who is he talking to there? But is that is but is that in the context? Is that actually spelled out as to as to that this idea of the Trinity? It, right. Would would the would the would the Jew would the first Hebrews who read that Genesis one have had the Trinity in their mind when they heard that? No, they wouldn't. So we're, we're, we have to start there and try to say what what would they understand by this phrase? Let us make man in our image. Does that appear? Does that appear elsewhere in the Old Testament? This this us reference. Can you remember, you guys? It, it actually only appears one other time. Two chapters later. So right after, right after the, the, the man and the woman eat of the fruit that they were not supposed to eat of, God says, the man has become like us. Do you remember that? Yeah. And he's become like us in what way? Knowing what? Yes. Yes. Good. So those are the only two places, and they're only two chapters apart, uh, where this 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 uh, you know uh, uh, first person plural is used. Us, you know, let us make man. The man has become like us. Uh, any idea? Any idea who he's talking to there? It's just us. <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing weird about it. It's just us. Could could it be referring to other gods? Well, the, yeah, the past, the, yeah, Genesis 18, the passage that you're referring to, that certainly is God coming with two angels because then he, then he, he dispatches the two angels to go down and rescue uh, Lot and his family from Sodom, right? R right. They call those theophanies. A theophany is an appearance of God as a, as a person. Um, Well, that, see, that's where we just, that's where we just have to be, we want to be very careful about making sure that we're not reading things back into verses, 
where they're not there initially. We, uh, the way that we study the Bible is to understand what the author's intention was in communicating to his readers in the original context. Whether we like it or not, that's how we communicate and that's how God chose to communicate his word to us. And so with that in mind, I think that the first thing that we have to recognize is that in that passage where it talks about in the beginning, God made heavens and the earth, that the word there is Elohim. And Elohim, from the very first words of the Bible, if you're a Hebrew, you recognize Elohim is a plural noun. So it's not radically weird that all of a sudden there's this us there. It does seem to jive with the plural noun that's used for the singular God, because then all the singular pronouns are used for this God as well. He did this. He did that. He spoke. It doesn't say they spoke. It doesn't say they did that or they did this. It's he, but it's Elo, It's Elohim. So I, I think the best explanation of that within the context is that the name is used, the plural noun is used because it, it intensifies, it intensifies or absolutizes God. Singular is not enough for God. This this plural is being used to emphasize who he is. Uh, maybe something like that. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that there's not some room here, that there's not some wiggle room like that the Old Testament leaves us with about divine persons. But uh, far, far more than you would see places like this, like let us make man in two, two verses in Genesis, you see this absolute emphasis on God as God alone, that there is one God, that he alone is God. He is exalted. He alone is worthy of praise. He alone stretched out the heavens. So it's just, it's it, you have to, in that context, that's so rabidly monotheistic, this could be a, this could be a plural of excellence, it could be a plural of majesty, like you were saying, Stephen, kind of like a Queen Elizabeth or some Queen Victoria would say, you know, uh, this uh, does not sit well with our royal you know, presence or we find this most disagreeable. <laughs> um, the problem is, like you said, Stephen, it's, it's, there's not a lot of examples to really establish that the plural of majesty or a plural of excellence were, at, were used in the Hebrew language at this point. Yeah, that's it, it is much it's much safer just and it's much more it's much it's legitimate it's much more legitimate and, and and accurate to say that the first readers would not have had this idea in their mind uh although I don't know I think it may leave some room for some of that um uh, I think that, that the best guess is though it, it it emphasizes that absoluteness of God it intensifies the word Elohim um, you know, that plural of power or whatever you would say of it. Uh, but it has to be balanced out with that clear testimony that God alone is God, you know, and that God, the Lord, our God is one. So those are some just things to keep in mind, you know, passages like that. Uh, there are other passages that, you know, Stephen mentioned about Theophanes, uh, the angel or messenger of, of Yahweh who appears in many passages um, and we'll kind of, we can talk about those in, in weeks coming up. Um, but let me, let me try to summarize with this simple idea for tonight. It's important to distinguish Trinitarianism from tritheism, right? We're, we're not people who believe in three gods. So we want to make that abundantly clear to anybody like Jehovah's witness or somebody who might not understand the concept that we're not talking about three gods. And there were there were ancient civilizations that had kind of trinities of three a three-faced god or something like that that were tritheistic, but that's not what we're talking about here as is clear from the Old Testament and the New Testament for there is one god. 
Another summary statement, belief in a triune God begins with an emphasis on the word God. In a world of many gods, the Hebrews served one God, the true God, the only God. As the only true God and the creator of all things, he alone was worthy of worship and service. So this is incredibly important that we just grasp this. I know that you guys believe this already and know this, but it's important just to go back over it, really spell it out, tease it out as much as we can, because once we get into the New Testament, uh, we have these striking statements that will really begin to kind of upset the apple cart <laughs> in, in, in some ways. So that's what but we got to start with this foundation. If, Hopefully that makes sense to you. Any questions? Any final questions on anything that we've talked about tonight? Yeah, even yeah, even the word. That's a great point, Christian. E even the the word image is singular. So let us make man in our image, not images. And then in verse twenty seven, it it switches back to the singular. So God created man in his own image. So, yeah, there's there's no there's no real room for 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 saying that God is that there's multiple gods talking. There's one God who's speaking about making man in his own image, and yet when he speaks, he says, "Let us make man in our image." And it's that plural uh those that those those uh pronouns that we have to that we have to kind of figure out why would he say us and our, um, and, and that that you know for the first readers that might have been the place where yeah they they would understand that to be in relationship to the word Elohim which is a plural noun it it connects with that and emphasizes the 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 absoluteness of God or power of God in some in some exalted way. It, it is kind of, it is it is still a mis I, it's important to say that it is still a mystery there's no real clear answer for that but Christians Trinitarians have found it have found it helpful to be able to go back and say even there there's some maybe foreshadowing or some indication that in this plural noun and use of the pronouns there's a kind of the first hints of of uh, something about the Godhead that is not is never quite teased out in the Old Testament. Yeah, and, that, and I, I can go with that. I think that I think that's okay to say. But it, it, you know, we like I said, we want to lay out the pieces in the order that we've received them because I, I think that helps us make sense of um, you know going that direction first. How about this for a final point, you guys? Uh, what we call a heart check, as we think about just a lot of concepts that we've talked about tonight. Um, given our theme this evening, I thought this might be a good question for us to leave with and pray for each other on. Though we may be monotheists in our confession, in what ways can all of us, in what ways can all of us struggle, delete that can, struggle to live this out?